Hey. I'll show you my cock if you show me yours. Hello YouTube and welcome back to the Craft Mask. It is I, Special Edition Alola Charlie, the best Pokemans. I've just got back from a dungeon run to the dark lands known as Florida. I got out of that place just in time. That walking anal secretion is trying to turn the place into the setting for the next Fallout game. I wish I were joking. It wasn't all bad though. I got really close to a dolphin. Otherwise, 3 out of 10. W would not recommend. As you can see, I got some loot. We have a new setup and some new equipment. Same old YouTuber, but hey. I am still in the middle of the Tusker project and found myself in need of skulls. Several years ago, I was investigating different kinds of low-budget mold-making techniques. It didn't produce the best results, but I did find a few niche uses for it. So I figured, I should make some more molds. And then I thought, that's content. So today, I'll be showing you how to make the cheapest mold possible. If you need a lot of skulls, you've come to the right place. Okay, this is the basic setup. You need a sticky surface, a retainer, and this can be made with just about anything. Mine happens to be thermoplastic, but you can make your retainer out of Lego, plasticine, whatever you have on hand, just so long as the silicone doesn't stick to it. And a release agent of your choice. Just wash everything afterwards. Straight out of the tube, silicone caulk isn't that well mixed, so we're going to start by manually mixing it. It also puts a little bit of oxygen into it, helps the curing process. So it's kind of best to do this in layers. The silicone will stick to itself even after it's partially dried. But, you know, in this case, I happen to do it all in one sitting because I'm reckless. The thicker you make these molds, the longer they take to cure, and if you make them too thick, there'll be chunks right in the middle that don't even cure at all. With the silicone properly mixed, we're putting it onto the cast object, starting with very small tools and working our way up. In this case, I'm using a very thin spring steel wire, taped up so it stops stabbing me in the fingers. Now, if there are small air bubbles in the silicone mold, it's not that big of a deal, but you don't want to have any air bubbles sitting directly on the cast object. Otherwise, the goal here is pretty simple. We just push in and draw out the silicone so that it works its way into all the finest details. Because of the viscosity, you really have to work it in to make sure it's sitting flush with the surface of the cast object and the retainer. And we use progressively larger tools as we get further into the process. Most of the caulk tubes will say that the silicone's dry within an hour, but that's a damn lie. In reality, you'll have a good skin on it after an hour, but underneath will still be uncured. So just to be safe, you want to leave these things for about five days or more. Honestly, there's no such thing as too much cure time for this. But with that being said, I'll see you in five. One week later. Separating the mold from the retainer requires a gentle touch. Silicone caulk doesn't have the kind of flex that platinum cure silicones have, so it's a slight bit more delicate. For that reason, we trim off all the overhangs and the little bits of flashing on the edges. Not just to make it look pretty, but also it protects the mold, because little loose bits are generally where the tears start to form. In the case of UV resins and two-part epoxy resins, like the five-minute epoxies that you get in the hardware store, it's a simple matter of just pouring it in. In both cases, you can use isopropyl alcohol to thin out the mixture to make it more fluid and to get your pour cleaner. UV resins tend to be harder and more brittle, while the two-part epoxy resins tend to be a little more rubbery. Because I did not have the proper tool on hand. I kind of splashed the resin in there rather haphazardly. So now I'm paying the price, laboriously removing all the excess resin flashing. Certain resins are pretty hard once set, so if you do have cleanup to do, it's going to take you forever. Best just to avoid it and only put in as much resin as you need. Is 
is why you apply it through these so you don't overfill and end up with troublesome pieces of shit like this. Now for hot glue, the approach is actually the exact opposite. What you want to do is stick the nozzle as deep into the mold as possible and squeeze it until it comes bursting out the top. This will drive the air out. In a way, it mimics injection molding. I wouldn't worry about the excess glue at all. It can be pretty easily trimmed off and then melted back down to be used again, which is what I did with this ogre skull here. It's kind of a mess, but yes, it's entirely possible to reuse excess glue. The hot glue is great for any kind of object you need to be somewhat flexible or that you would like to permanently affix to another object using heat. Unfortunately, most hot glue is not capable of being sanded, though you might be able to get away with it using some of the wood glue glue sticks, although they are slightly yellow in color. If that sort of thing matters to you, oh well. For plaster, we want to get a one-to-one -one mix of plaster and water, and then wet down the mold with a fine spray of water or alcohol. This will create a capillary, capillary, eh. This will break up the surface tension and allow the plaster to find its way into all the fine details of the mold. And we drop the plaster into the mold. Whatever you use to do this has to have a large enough spout because liquid plaster under pressure hardens almost immediately and plugs up the spout. Or you can just lose your shit like I did and start smearing it around. Just plaster can be pretty forgiving. The correct mixture will turn out white and opaque throughout most of its process. However, if you've put too much water into your mix, or if you sprayed the mold with too much water, the plaster will turn kind of yellow, and a lot of that excess water will push up to the top. Now, don't panic, these will still set. It'll just take a little longer. Although, you can just throw more plaster powder on top and kind of mush it in, and you'll come away with a normal mixture. Then you want to leave it for about, well, maybe an hour, and you should just be able to pop them right up. I love just how easy it is to clean up the plaster. It is so soft and so brittle. Now you might say, oh, well, that makes it a bad material. Well, it depends on what you're casting. When it's just going to be a pile of skulls in the corner, it's all good. As you can see, the features of the casts that are simple in shape come out just fine. But those that have very outstretched details, like these horns, are almost impossible to get out without snapping. But you can always try to get lucky. Because the plaster is porous, you can actually reinforce it after the fact by soaking it in very liquid glue. Whether that's uh, super glue or wood glue is up to you. But also be aware that it does require some kind of glue, like a Mod Podge, to seal it in. Otherwise, it's going to absorb a lot of the paint that you try to put on it. And here you can see some of the results. Glue, resin, and the plaster. Now, I've also experimented with expanding foams and they kind of work. They're just too soft to be load-bearing. When it comes to terrain, there really is no such thing as a messed up casting. It's just more rubble for your ruins. Now I'm gonna do a fast, very messy dry brush just to pick out the details. Oyamaru, or blue stuff, gets a lot of love online, but it really is fairly useless. There's a whole bunch of casting material you can't use with it. Mostly because they have exothermic reactions, which means that, that blue stuff's gonna melt again. So, silicone is the way to go. The only thing you can't put in a silicone mold is more silicone. But, scaling up this method, thermoplastics can make good shells to reinforce a mold, which you might need if you're gonna be casting anything larger than infantry. In the case of this barricade, I used the silicone with an aggregate in it, and then I shape a shell around the silicone using thermoplastic. On the particularly large casts, you're going to want to put some sort of support into the casting material as well. I would suggest stuff like cellulose fiber, medical gauze, or wire. And in case you're wondering, this particular technique isn't limited to just one-sided molds. You can make two-sided molds. The trick is to only partially cover the object you're trying to cast, then split it in half and finish the remaining side, because you don't want to fully encase the cast object. Note that wherever you're planning on cutting the mold should be where the silicone is applied thickest. So that about wraps it up. 
Yeah, and before I go, I humbly ask that you like, comment, subscribe, join Patreon, join Discord, slaughter a goat, Do a flip. and pray to the algorithm gods that this video does well. Yeah, you know what? Just pray for your boy in general, because the temperatures are so high right now, I think I might have actually died and gone to hell. So, until next time, my infernal friends, aloha. I'm still in the middle of the pro- Ah, oh, it's all garbage. Think, Charlie. You've lost your train of thought, but I know you can find it if you just believe in yourself. Who am I kidding? I don't believe in myself. Ah, good enough.